Today's session is uh, kindly sponsored by Comscope and we'll be hearing from them shortly uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, retirement communities, senior living uh, and how they are evolving from a traditional model to more innovative and exciting ways of living. Uh, as I said, this session is um, one in a series that's a uh, precursor to uh, Urban Living Festival, which will be taking place at Tobacco Dock in London on July the 7th and the 8th next year. And it will be looking at all sorts of different hospitality and real estate asset classes and how they are converging, uh, both in terms of investment and operations. Uh, as I said, the main event is happening um, in the summer next year, but we have launched uh, what we're calling the Urban Living Light series, which are um, business networking events limited to 30 attendees, which is the maximum we can do um, in compliance with the current COVID regulations, but they'll also be streamed as well. So they're, they're on and offline concurrently. Uh, we did the first one yesterday in central London, um, which was a look at um, what's happening specifically in that market. Um, it went very well. It was great to, great to be out and about and actually see people in the flesh. Um, felt strangely novel, <laughs> but it was very enjoyable nonetheless. Uh, there's another one uh, next week, uh, hosted at the Minotti Showroom in London, um, and another one on, on November the 3rd. And there'll be a series of these um, throughout November. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for those. So this session uh, will last around 45 minutes and then we'll have Q&A at the end. You can submit any questions you might have as we're going along uh, using the chat function in Zoom uh, and we'll get around to, to um, answering those at the end of the session. If you could keep yourself uh, muted uh, and your camera off unless you're one of our panellists that would be appreciated, that helps things go, uh, go smoothly. Um, you'll be able to see the uh, details of all the events I mentioned in the chat at uh, the side there as well. My name is George Sell, I'm the Editor-in-Chief at International Hospitality Media. Uh, we are an online B2B publisher for the hospitality industry and also an events organiser. I've got a couple of um, real innovators in the senior living space with us today. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves shortly. But first, I just wanted to give the uh, session a little bit of context, um, because this is a really interesting market. Uh, this particular slide shows the average life expectancy in England and Wales, but the trends are broadly similar across the developed world. And it's actually quite startling when you look at it. Uh, if you go back just 100 years, the average life expectancy for a male was just 55 years uh, and 60 for a female. If you look at how that's, that's changed um, since then, it, it's quite phenomenal. It is actually leveling off now, um, but you know, it's, it's still, um, the implications of this for, for the, the property market are, are enormous. And we can see that by looking at some of these, um, some of these stats. So in 10 years time, one in five people in the UK will be aged 65 or over. Um, nearly 7% will be over 75 and 3.2% will be 85 and older. Uh, in the US, the 65 plus age group by 2050 um, is going to uh, see a more than 50% increase to 85.6 million people. Uh, and here in England, 64% of outright owner households in England are headed by uh, somebody aged 65 and over. Uh, the, in the UK, the, the senior living market is tiny compared with uh, more mature markets such as Australia, New Zealand and the US. Uh, I think in, in parts of Europe, it's also more developed than here. Uh, Patrick McMahon from Bidwell says, Specialised housing for seniors is going to be hugely important in the coming year as demand grows dramatically to accommodate our ageing population. Too many over 65s remain in their own homes long after they have stopped being suitable for their needs. They're put off by the tax burdens associated with downsizing, a lack of choice in retirement living housing 
and uncertainty about leaving a much loved home. Um, Savile's uh, numbers here, the population aged 75 stands at 5 million and is due to grow by 1.9 million over the next 30 years. But there are only 726,000 dedicated retirement dwellings in the UK at the moment. Uh, so Savills estimates the sector is as much as 45% undersupplied. Uh, the COVID crisis has hit the elderly population hard and has exposed the terrible truth that many millions of people in later life do not have a safe place to call home. That's from uh, Guild Living, uh, an operator here in the UK. So before I ask our two panellists to introduce themselves, I just want to have a quick uh, word from uh, Stefan, from our sponsor, Comscope. Stefan, would you like to tell us what you guys do? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, George. Um, yeah, first of all, thanks to everybody. We're really delighted to be able to uh, sponsor this event. Uh, Comscope uh, is, uh, with its ruckus brand, strongly rooted in the hospitality industry. Where we have, uh, where we are in over fifty thousand properties around the globe, uh, and Comscope is a network company. So we do simple, reliable, adaptable networks, from basically the wires, the Wi-Fi to the cellular, and we identified, uh, of course, uh, this MDU senior living space as very interesting. We're venturing into this for quite a while. And we find that a highly interesting market also for us to learn how to be of good support to the industry because we feel that the needs in this industry demand good networks that are built uh, in accordance to the demands that exist in that market. So we're very much looking forward to sponsoring that. You certainly ran across the Ruckus brand and others. And uh, yeah, we hope that this, uh, we think that this is a great event and we're very, very honored to be able to sponsor this. Thanks very much. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks very much. Okay, so let's, um, let's ask our speakers to uh, introduce themselves. Uh, Justin, would you like to go first? Tell us a bit about yourself and your company. Sure, thanks. Um, and actually, before, before I tell you about myself, I want to just quickly say that graph that you showed at the beginning, um, which everyone saw, so that's like, I think it's really important to understand though that that isn't, um, so it's like a, it's a very often quoted graph, but actually it doesn't mean that, um, it, it's basically driven by a, um, a, a lack of infant mortality as population grows. So it used to be that people would die very young. Um, and so that is why the average age is about 45 in the 1980s and now it's like 90. So it's not necessarily that everyone lives longer, it's just that in the past, if you lived past 25, you were much more likely to live till in your 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, so it's a tiny technical point, but it's a really important one because I often, and I'm not saying that you did, but I often see that graph um, being misquoted and used in the wrong context. So um, just to reframe it. Um, uh, but sorry, I'll tell you about me and I'll tell you about Cohab. Um, so hi everyone, my name's Justin. She, uh, and I'm founder of a company called The Cohab. And Cohab is a new intergenerational living venture. And what that means within our definition is we're creating an alternative to a retirement living product where younger adults also live within our schemes and they live at affordable rents and are part of the community. So we're not just creating age ghettos for older adults. Um, and we are doing this, well, the company was born from two clear observations and two perspectives. One of them was that for a quite personal one, I grew up living um, in the same household as my grandfather, um, which was a really awesome way to grow up. And I learned a huge amount from him. Um, and, you know, he always said that having me and my siblings around kept him active and engaged and that we got him on the internet. And from a social perspective, it had always been going around in my mind, actually, like, hey, much younger and much young older people do actually have a lot in common and a lot to gain from each other, which is not what society tells us. You know, that's not the narrative you read in, in the newspapers, but like it is true. And if you can think of kind of you know much older much younger people you've got in your lives so they often have really enriching relationships there um yet it's increasingly difficult to have those naturally in society today so whereas we used to live in streets or in villages where we knew everyone of all different ages increasingly we are siloing people by age um 
And that is not necessarily a good thing for anyone, be they old or young. Um, so that was the kind of first observation. Second observation was actually, you know, I, I was working in the kind of real estate investment market and retirement living. And um, I found it bizarre that loads of investors were telling me that it was the next big thing. Everyone was saying, oh, retirement living is the next big thing. But I can never meet an older person that wants to move into one of these schemes. Like, honestly, if you talk to most older people, they say, they say, uh, no, I don't want to move to a retirement home. Um, it's just like, okay, this is dumb. Like, why is the sector obsessed with building these products that this is clearly bad product market fit? And there's clearly an opportunity, you know, given the kind of, you know, the stats and the demographics, there's clearly an opportunity to create much more attractive, compelling product than some of the um, older stock that we've seen and what is, you know, in people's minds as a retirement home and what, what that delivers. So we did a huge amount of research. We got really interested in this concept of intergenerational living because we found what was coming out time and time again from a lot of older people is saying, I don't want to live just around other old people. I want to live in mixed communities where I'm around younger people. I want to be engaged. I want to be part of the community and so forth. We went to Europe, saw a few kind of intergenerational schemes there, came back to UK, launched the Cohab, which is effectively, um, it is like an independent retirement living scheme from a lot of the real estate perspective. And in terms of the um, kind of services we can offer, but as I say, you know, we always have an affordable component for younger adults. Um, we are we brought in a lot of the learning from the co-living space in terms of how we run events and activities, how we create a community. In terms of the product, it's very we're very much focused on urban locations where people are part of a community next to services, um, and it's closer on a product side to a kind of highly amenitized build to rent scheme luxury one than you than you would think if you moved to like a care home or so so that's me that's cohab and i look forward to this debate great thank you justin um jan we've got a video from you to show shortly so um do you want to quickly introduce yourself and then we'll go into the sure sure uh, uh, uh hi and welcome everybody thanks for uh having the opportunity to be uh speaking to you guys uh today uh just an amazing uh would, would you just explain? I think Coop is an amazing place. Um, my name is Jan Gard. I'm the founder of the Embassies of Good Living. Uh, we focus on a little bit different uh, target market than Justin uh, and Coop does. Our scheme is a sort of a co-living, co-retiring kind of product for people who are scared of retirement homes. So uh, we, we, we often quote it as sort of the anti-retirement community we're building. Uh, and we're rather working with social bonds and, and connecting people. Um, Throughout our research we've done, um, we've probably seen uh, over the years now, a little over 100 retirement homes globally uh, and, and sort of one of the, the most recurring uh, subjects throughout that research was similarly to what Justin just mentioned, that people even in that, let's say, demographic 80 plus, uh, the worst thing from their perspective is that in those retirement communities, they're only old people. Uh, and it's kind of, a, kind of an obvious one uh when you think about it but still that was sort of the driving force we've built our model on top and so uh ultimately the embassies of good living will is sort of a network of those residences that are kind of a hybrid of residential and commercial so the commercial is always uh, attracting a wider range demographic getting into our our, our uh, locations and our embassies and then on top of it sits a residential product which is an embassy, so people who live with us become ambassadors, uh, and that is really, let's say, traditional um, resi play uh, with the service living component to it. And so that is a little bit sort of the the basic concept and idea uh, we've put together. And maybe the I hope the video explains a little bit more. Okay, let's have, let's have a look. For those who think of getting older as getting better at life, the Embassies offers a curated premium co-living experience. Our international network of residences brings together tenants, members and visitors to create a global collective with the good life in mind. That means spaces designed to your taste in the hearts of the world's most exciting cities. Events you come away from with a fresh perspective on the future and a community of people continually expanding their horizons. Founded in Switzerland and globally at home, the Embassies is about attending to the details we know mean the most. We're here to help you make the very best of life, no matter your age. Now more than ever, you have the freedom to choose what's next.
Great there stuff. So picking up on your strap line now more than ever, we, uh, before we started the call, we had a quick chat and, and uh, COVID obviously dominated the conversation there. So let's get that out of the way and, and talk about the, the impact that's having on the sector, both in terms of operation uh, operations and, and, and demand. You know, is it, is it making people assess their options of where they want to live um, as they get older? Um, Jan, what's your take on that? Uh, let me first start by saying uh, we are not operational yet. So our first location is uh, due to be opened end of next year, uh, ideally. Uh, so we are in a very positive uh, kind of situation that we are not in the heart of the exposure the, the rest of all the operating businesses are in. So uh, that uh, set aside, uh, I know that the next sentence I'm going to say is, is, a, is a weird one. Um, but nevertheless, Corona is the single best thing that could have happened to the embassy's business case as such um, for a variety of reasons, um, which is obviously not uh, crazily popular to say it uh, <laughs> in these times, especially as we see a lot of our friends in hospitality struggling uh, tremendously and, and really trying to survive in, in these uncertain times. Um, that said, for us, as, as sort of a growing business, um, I think there are a few elements that, that play crazily in our favor right now. So where we normally would compete with uh, yeah, upper upscale hotel operators, uh, luxury hotel operators uh, trying to uh, acquire a building or, or take a lease on a building, uh, we see a lot less appetite on that area. Prices are coming down tremendously. Um, I think everybody knows sort of somewhere between 10 and, and 20, 25% currently already uh, more or less across Northern Europe. Uh, and j yesterday I had a phone call with uh, a hotel operator uh, in Cape Town uh, and it's, I mean, you can all imagine that there is a, a gigantic opportunity for, on the real estate side of things uh, coming up. So that's one side. The other side, upside we're seeing is a ton of people out of the hospitality industry uh, trying to find new, uh, new gigs and new jobs. So on the labor market, this is tremendously playing into our favor, uh, which we obviously never anticipated. But most importantly, I think for us is when we look at our customers, the demand and the, let's say, the appetite for a, a secure network in place. So the embassy's model is really based around the notion of self-determined individual living, right? So you can move in in your 50s, 60s, 70s, whenever you want to come. Uh, and then we make sure that we extend the let's say the situation of you being able to live on your own for as long as possible. So we try to keep you out of the, let's say, traditional uh, retirement communities. And that is really something, obviously, a lot of people realize throughout the last yeah, uh, weeks and months um, that that is incredibly interesting. Uh, building on top of that, the opportunity to, to have like a, a security network in place where people can check in, uh, check in on you. Um, <laughs> doing simple things like doing errands, uh, running errands and, and doing grocery shopping. Uh, but also that, I say, small, uh, slight uh, approach towards community. We see a lot of, um, uh, yeah, let's say loneliness. Uh, they say it's killing more people than drunk driving, uh, drug abuse uh, and uh, together. Uh, and I think when, when you look at the fact that the, COVID only amplified the loneliness uh, spiral in, in, yeah, globally. Um, that is obviously crazily relevant and, and becoming even more relevant. So um, I think those two elements and then on top of it, the, the, the situation in real estate currently that a lot of uh, asset managers and investors are trying to recalibrate their portfolio, whereas traditionally it might have been either very much focusing towards uh, office use or uh, to retail or uh, maybe even to hospitality. A lot of those discussions um, we see and we are increasingly engaging in are shifting. And as our model sort of ultimately is a commercial hybrid thing. So on the, on the, on the first couple of floors, we've got commercial zoning and then on top of it, so it's residential and the residential is even in a pandemic situation, stabilizing the rent opportunity for us. So even though we would have to close the entire public spaces, the members club, uh, the restaurants, the bars, the cafes, the bakery, etc., etc., we would still make rent for the residential components on top. Um, so I think summing it up, the, 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 from a business perspective, Corona has been crazily playing into our favor. 
but obviously, uh, if I could have chosen it, I would have obviously gone around Corona and uh, would suffer, <laughs> uh, not those uh, trivia losses we've seen uh, globally over the last couple of months. Thanks. Thanks, Jan. J Justin, from the consumer demand side of things, are you seeing uh, an increase in people inquiring um, because they've been unnerved by what's happened with the pandemic? Um, I mean, we've definitely got more kind of interest in through traffic on our website recently. Um, but, you know, we're in a similar position to Jan in that we, we, don't we, we don't have live customers yet. So we're also kind of, you know, building our first um, and so we, yeah, look, I think I've got a lot of sympathy for the kind of, um, and for the kind of existing operators that are out there. And I know that talking to them, you know, it's been a really, really hard time for them, you know, having to cope with this, like it's everyone's worst nightmare when you've got, if you're, you're managing a scheme where you've got, you know, older vulnerable people that you really care about and, 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 and you've got this virus coming in and there's a lot of, and no one quite knows what's happening. And if you go back to March, if you think how, you know, we were all feeling then, um, it was a very scary, tough time. You know, add that, the fact you've got a hundred older people who are vulnerable to look after too, and they're all asking you questions and their children are coming, asking you questions. Like it's a really, really nasty thing to go through. So, you know, I've got a huge, huge sympathy and, and respect for, for the people that were kind of managed to cope with it. Um, I think what it, I mean, from looking at the kind of positives that you can take away from it, you know, similar to what Jan was saying from our side, you know, we do feel that we're in a strong position to um, kind of really position our model in a post-COVID world now. You know, we're not on the back foot trying to change existing systems and existing services to be able to work in a, you know, new world. Like we can design them from scratch. Um, and that's that's really valuable for us in terms of being able to, to create competitive advantage and you know create the, you know, this whole um, webinars about you know the commu retirement communities of the future and how they look how they will be looking going forward rather than what they've been in the past. So that's definitely kind of really good thing for us. Um, I think yeah, I think that this this kind of social um, this social element is really really important. I think that. Everyone, whether they're young or old, of any age, has experienced some form of kind of isolation um, and loneliness over the last kind of six months, um, and and uh, that is really a, I think it's quite a healthy thing for society because it makes everyone realise what it's like to be an old person, who's and, and you know, have a bit more sympathy and empathy for what it's like to spend, you know, a lot of your week maybe not seeing anyone or you know maybe not leaving your house more than once a week and getting one phone call a week and it's it's really tough and, and so i think that's that's positive that it's brought our kind of awareness around and more older people and their needs um and definitely you know everyone's feeling that communities are really important now in a way that we haven't necessarily haven't considered them before so there's definitely an opportunity there from the kind of social side i think also if we look at if we look at the whole kind of landscape of the market, you know, specifically in the UK, I know we've got a lot of people from all over Europe and all over the world on this call, but to, to kind of put it in context, the UK has had a very, very, um, the, the, the care home market in the UK has had a very, very bad crisis. They're probably a worse crisis than any other group. Um, you know, care homes in the UK, it's exposed that they've been completely neglected um, they have, they've been underfunded by governments. They haven't been given the right resources. You know, PPE and testing was directed away from care homes towards other services across the country. And basically people in care homes were left to die um, because they were seen as, you know, inevitably these people are gonna die sooner anyway, so let's just sacrifice them effectively. And no one would say that, you know, the politicians wouldn't say that, but that's effectively what was causing that decision. Um, and, and that means that everyone's become everyone has become much more aware of how grim the care crisis is in the UK. And I think what that presents as a really strong opportunity for retirement providers in this space is to really be differentiating their product around, you know, what are we providing? You know, from Cohabits thinking, okay, well, well, we are not a care home, and actually, if you really need a care home, there are better places for you, but you can come and live with us in a really great community where we'll look after you, we'll look out for you. We won't do physical care for you, like nursing care, but effectively we're enabling you to live longer without having to go into a care home. 
and you know it's very clearly not a care home and actually we can kind of use that to our advantage and i think there will be i think the market will really open up for providers that can um differentiate that as as we're doing um and i think for you know just for the last thing i think an opportunity that i'm really excited about that we've just scratched the surface of is what this is going to mean in terms of um customers using technology within our schemes you know there's there'd always been this there's, when you look at kind of much older adults there's there's it tends to be quite polarizing in their use of technology you've either got your kind of you know people in their late 70s 80s who spend like half their day on facebook and just like love technology and they're like all over it and just like so excited and they like send you like memes on whatsapp and stuff or you've got people who just like cannot do it and they're, and they're just psychologically just don't want to get involved in it they feel like they've missed a boat and they've got this big barrier um but what you've seen over the last six months is everybody having to embrace technology so you've got if, if you're 95 you've either got a choice of speaking to your grandchildren on zoom or not speaking to them at all and people have had to embrace technologies like zoom they've had to embrace ways to kind of communicate that aren't the traditional forms um and i'm really really excited about what that means in terms of how uh, our customers can be connect we can keep them connected to the outside world and how they can connect each other within the scheme um, and, and, and yeah, I think there's some really exciting opportunities that will emerge around technology for older adults now. Thanks, Justin. Just want to quickly touch on definitions and, and ask whether you guys are happy with the term retirement living, because most of the old people I know, not only do they not want to move into a traditional retirement uh, development, they don't want to retire either. They, they want to scale down, but they want to keep their hand in doing bits and pieces. So is there is there a better term that to, to use to describe what, what we're providing Jan, what, what do you think it's an interesting one i think terminology uh, specifically in, in that demographic is is a, is, a, is a tough cookie right i think we've all been uh, following the, the the okay boomer discussion um i think when I look at our segment, and I think it's it's uh, maybe that that's also a leeway into into the into answering your question there. I don't think that we can continue to look at customers like we did before, right? So at the moment, I mean, even we in this discussion are focusing, let's say, senior living. These are seniors, right? Sixty-five plus, then you're a senior. Uh, obviously, it's, it's the same bullshit than uh, saying these are millennials, right? There's there are these millennials that play computer all day long, and then there are these millennials that uh, hit the streets, protest for uh, climate change, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, similarly, accounts for, for for the demographic we are targeting. I think the the customer base we are looking for and, and looking after, and sort of the, the embassy's customer, so the the ambassador of the good life, they definitely don't look at retiring. Right. So uh, in the movie, we, we, we've quoted, uh, we think about getting older is getting better at life. And I think there is that customer, but then there's the traditional customer that is more accustomed to the, let's say, the approach uh, as the offer is currently. Right? And there's a totally fair space for that. And I think we just see that uh, what has been a one size fits all approach to senior living or to, let's say, residential offerings for people in their later lives. Uh, will that further will diversify uh, dramatically over the coming years? And I think, <clears throat> uh, similarly to any product, you can't design a product that's for everybody. <laughs> I don't believe in such a thing. Uh, so you need to know who your customer is, right? And you need to understand what that customer demands, what their needs are, what their pain points are. And I think when I look at our customer, they really want to continue to stay active. They want to get away from the stigmas of getting older. They want to shy away from everything that says senior living. So the worst thing we could be doing is saying the embassies of good living, the best place for senior living. That would be the worst kind of communication we could in, uh, engage in. So for us, it's really about the notion of continuous learning, continuously inspiring, continuously building new neural pathways, getting people active and, and, and making sure that they remain active in many ways. I think when you look at a traditional care home, often, uh, more than often the, the case is the business model for a care home tradition is getting people into, the, into a bed and then making sure that they live for as long as possible. That's where the, the industry makes most money. The embassy's model is diametrically different. We lose our customer the second he goes into that stage. So for us, we try to make sure that it doesn't matter if you're 110 or, uh, or 55, we want to keep you active mentally and physically. 
So getting you in touch with uh, new ideas, new inspiration, and making sure that you that you continue continuously drive that notion. Um, fun fact: uh, when you look, there's a there's a beautiful, um, uh, very upscale retirement community in Luxembourg. Um, we visited, and there's like the the most expensive room has got an office in it, and that is is really traditional uh, tr traditional traditional senior living, but in a nice way. But what it says is that people want to continuously stay engaged and work often is one of those leeways into social bonds, into social connectivity. So they might not run into the office five days a week, but they might very well continuously working on the project they really like and that they really embrace. And I think, <coughs> excuse me, in our segment, we focus on the, let's say, uh, entrepreneurial driven minded person. Uh, and those kind of person have a tendency to, not letting go of the businesses they've built entirely. So that is exactly what we see there. So the, the staying active, enjoying life, never fully retire and have the opportunity to when necessary and when intended and when people want to access a communal area and, so, and, and interact socially. But if they don't want that, that they can also pull out. So I think being able and being in control of that social and privacy uh, cursor, if you will, uh, is, is, is key in that sense. Yeah, thanks, Jan. Justin, does that tally with, with demand from, from your customers that they want to, um, you know, they, they don't want to retire in the traditional way, they want, they want to keep active, whether that's running a business or doing some part-time stuff. And, and I guess that, that chimes with what you said about the use of technology, you know, good networks and so on to keep them, uh, keep them connected. Yeah, no, it really does. I mean, yeah, most people, um, most people of whatever age want to do that, right? Like people want to live independently active lives generally. Um, yeah, no, I completely agree with all that. I think, yeah, the, the, the terminology piece is really hard. And there are some people that will, some people quite like the term retirement. They're like, oh, that's kind of cool. Like, that sounds got like a nice ring to it. And then there are some people who are like, oh, that's a horrible word. I don't want anything to do with it. It's stigmatized. So yeah, it's a challenge. And it's a challenge for, for everyone to find, you know, what are the terms that resonate with people? What are the ones that people, various people find stigmatizing? Um, and that's, uh, it's just something that's going to grow over time. I think people will begin to become more comfortable with these terms. Yeah. Yeah. So a traditional retirement development, apart from the actual living space, in terms of communal space, it might have a lounge and it might have some gardens, but, but very little else. So what are you guys doing to, to mix that up and to bring in a more varied environment for people? Um, Justin, maybe you can go first on that one. Yeah, so our, um, our product design in terms of the kind of amenity spaces and how that works is all led by um, wanting to facilitate community. So it's all about you know, subtle designs that allow people to naturally interact as many times throughout the day as they, as they want. And so while there are some people that um, you know, would like to go to the organized movie night on a Thursday evening or like to go to the coffee morning, there are some people that you know, they won't necessarily want to go to those kind of organized events. Um, and so the more kind of interactions you can naturally encourage within the building, the better it is then for those people and for the wider community that they kind of begin to kind of subtly get to know each other. So, you know, design is really important for that in terms of where you're placing your reception area, you know, in and out of the building. Are you meeting each other in the interaction points? Where do people come and collect their mail and their packages? Like, is there an opportunity for them to meet people there? Like, you know, going to the lift, coming through the corridors, like all those kind of touch points is really important that, you know, we create enough space and it's designed in a way that people are interacting on a, on a kind of anecdotal basis day to day all the time. Um, so that's one thing. I think in terms of what we provide, we, by nature of targeting very central urban locations, we are fairly amenity light. So we're not providing swimming pools. We're not providing big gyms. We're not providing salons. And a lot of those things that you would get in more kind of luxury retirement villages, that's just not really our model. Instead, we're 
focusing on partnerships within the local community. So allowing our residents to have a discount at the local gym and a discount at the local pool and a discount at the local cinema. And, 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 and it, again, that kind of fits into our ethos of being part of the wider community and getting people out. But we do always make sure we've got so very large reception area, which is the kind of anecdotal meeting point for everyone coming in and out and where our staff see them. And then always kind of a very uh, buzzy, lively uh, kind of cafe area where it might be you might be showing TV at some point, so like people are just kind of talking, and then a much quieter kind of library area where there are newspapers, and people might bring come do some work on the computer, um, more of a kind of you know, kind of study area, if you will, but within a kind of library setting. And then outside space again is really really important for us that everyone has an opportunity to go outside, and you know that that garden is completely run by the residents; they can grow things if they want. Um, that's kind of so yeah yeah that's kind of what we're looking for amenity spaces in terms of our actual um living spaces all the units are quite big it's bigger than you would get in a typical build to rent scheme because most of our customers just have more stuff so it's difficult when they want to downsize um and they're used to having bigger spaces um it's slight it's less it's it's a different type of fit out it's wider door frames it's wheelchair accessibility it's different kind of um, feel of the bathrooms but when we design them we're, we're, you know you wouldn't go into one of these and think oh this is an old person's flat it doesn't feel like that it doesn't look like that there are some very subtle kind of design tweaks but really it's about creating something beautiful that works well for everyone but allows people to live there for the rest of their life and that you can subtly add grab rails say in the bathroom at a later point in their life when they might need them and so forth yeah, and what communal amenities would uh, would an embassy property have? Um, yeah, I, I think again, I think our cast is slightly different. Our product is slightly different uh, to Justin's. Uh, that said, I think what Justin just explained uh, definitely brings uh, or hammers down the point that uh, traditional retirement homes uh, need to be uh, on the lookout for people like Justin, because <laughs> uh, uh, for, for for the principal reason that. Um, design and functionality, right? We've seen that over the last, I don't know, 50, 60 years or so, how design changed and from functional design uh, design uh, to static design, back to functional design. And I think what Justin just mentioned is that just because it needs to work, it does uh, need, needs to work well, it doesn't need to look ugly, right? I think uh, Justin's point is, is totally, totally uh, correct. And I think uh, that's also some, something that products uh, will, uh, on a wider scale dramatically change. I'm currently sitting in a wheelchair because I broke my leg. Uh, I'm not expecting that uh, our our customers will uh, be okay with such a wheelchair. I think the, the entire industry is is, is definitely in, 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 in a waiting and in a holding pattern for a massive redesign in, in a, var a variety of spaces. So that's just as a, as a side note to Justin's point there. Um, when we think about what do we offer in our building, right? I think for us, the basic principle notion is, again, that old person that once told me when I uh, sat down with him in a retirement community, when I asked him, what do you hate most about this place? He said, the other old people. Uh, and I think this is so fucking true when you think about it, when you sit, when, when you just think about that person that sits in that chair and hasn't seen anybody else, just his uh, age cohort, and then a few uh, family members uh, sneaking in that, that once a month visit, uh, that's not really a compelling story to look forward to. So I think when we designed our model and designed our, our principle, we thought about it slightly differently. So for us, we call it the emphasis of good living, so we bring people together. But the, the, the primary objective for the, the operation, the model is what we call community as a service. So for us, the doors are really there to be open. So for us, uh, we've got on ground floor amenities that really drive in people. So we offer tremendously quality for money uh, in order to attract uh, a wide range demographic. We offer a bakery store in all of our facilities on ground floor because the bakery is the most democratized place on the planet, right? Everybody in the morning goes and, and gets bread rolls, right? For, for, for breakfast. So for us, it's always the, 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 the let's say the public figure, uh, the public facing, uh, window of the embassy is always about attracting people in and that doesn't matter if you're 20 if you're 6 if you're 25 or 80 80 87 you're welcome on top of that it's our 
let's say we call it community as a service members club. That's the ambassadors club, which is targeting again, not only the people who live with us, but sort of the, the wider demographic of the city uh, who share our values of high quality programming, art, culture, design, etc. And then on top of that, it's residential. And when you think about an embassy, an embassy can't be too big because then it's by definition a bit of an odd place. Uh, so we always limit the amount of residences we have got in, in the building. So ultimately, what you what you see is that we've got uh, only if only depends a little bit on the building, but somewhere between fifty and and let's say sixty apartments to be let on top. And then we've got the communal space and we've got the public space. So when you rock up at our building, it doesn't it does never feel like an old people town. And that is the entire mentality around it. So we think back, what kind of services do we offer? We offer the same services that you would expect from a higher upscale uh, kind of members club, boutique kind of members club. So think everything from, we don't like the word co-working because it's a bit of a burnt terminology, especially in real estate these days. Uh, we, we call it uh, collaborative workspaces or whatever. Uh, we, we all, every location has got an event space, a theater space, and, uh, a small cinema, uh, quite substantial uh, area of wellness and fitness. Because uh, again, staying mentally but also physically active is this instrumental to our uh, to our audience. We'd like always to include an artist studio, so for people to continuously being 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 uh, creative and and also uh, bringing external creatives in. So it's really about everything that that sort of makes people gather and and and, and enjoy life. So that that sounds fantastic, but it also sounds very. Uh capital intensive so what sort of locations are you are you looking for are you are you looking to do that in prime uh, city center locations uh, for the embassies we, we look at uh, premium locations and premium areas uh, that are somewhere between the let's say we don't need the high street but we need uh, close proximity to public transport to uh, those little cafes around the corner that we really like uh, that little italian place across the street uh, the theater around the corner Maybe there's a, I don't know, a swimming pool around the corner or a park. So we, we want to be in, a, in an urban s a setting where people naturally gather and, 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 and come and are. So we definitely need high density footfall areas, mm -hmm. but we don't need, uh, I don't know, uh, high street uh, kind of settings. That said, the building itself needs to be representative because, again, that's a little bit maybe aiming for that upper upscale market. If you, if you call yourself the embassies, you, you can't go into a 50s uh, with a glass window facade kind of office uh, refurbishment. That's not really working, right? So our customer has got a tendency to normally, when they bought the plane, turn left. So they, uh, they're looking for an upgrade in their life. And that is really the, sort of the mental framework we've, we've attached also. So for us, being awarded ambassadorship in an embassy should be the highest degree of shit now i know where i'm going guess guess where i'm going right so it's kind of this this owning this proudness uh and, and and really embracing that that let's say uh section in life that might uh for some people started in their 50s some in their 70s some in their 80s yeah okay thanks Jan. um justin you're also looking at urban locations do you yeah. think, um do you think this is indicative of a of a demand for older people to actually move into city centres, perhaps from the suburbs or, or outlying regions? Yeah, definitely, like hundred percent. And I think actually, you know, it's not if you zoom out from you know what Jan and I are doing and look at the whole retirement living sector as a whole, even the, you know the big players, you know, with like McCarthy and Stone, the biggest house builder here in the UK of retirement homes, like um, all of these companies are now focusing more on urban products. They are all uh, trying to capture um, that kind of suburban, urban customer. Um, I think partly because, yes, you know, changing shifts in demographics, you know, older people are no longer what we would consider, you know, that they're not, they're no, not necessarily, they kind of grew up in the, they're not necessarily the people that fought in the war these days, you know, it's a different kind of, a uh, different kind of customer. Um, and I think urban lends itself to that. Um, I think also because the physical product is beginning to look more like residential as well. So, so you know, there's a bit more of a movement away from this kind of retirement village 
model that was popular initially. Um, and so that lends itself to a more urban product as well. So yeah, definitely indicative of, of customer changes. Um, and I think there's also a, uh, there's also a kind of, if, if, if you look at where wealth is distributed in the country now, it's something like 75% of all of the UK's wealth is held amongst the over 50s. So, you know, there is no wealth distribution anymore. You know, younger people, most of them will never get on the housing ladder. It's just not going to happen. Um, and so there's a huge amount of um, capital that's kind of held amongst older people now. And um, that means that they can afford to be in the nice, the, the more expensive places, ultimately, places where maybe traditionally were for younger people or younger families are no longer. Um, they, they'll find it harder to compete. Um, because there's a lot of people that have the cash. Um, so we're definitely seeing that in, kind of, in, in terms of trends as well. And I think that's a, a trend that's going to just, it's, it's, it's a growing trend that I can't really see being addressed anywhere. Yeah. You mentioned McCarthy and Stones. Those guys and their competitors traditionally sold their units, but I believe they are starting to look at a rental model um, yeah. as are some others. Is, is that um, a trend that we're going to see more of, r rented rather than bought accommodation? Definitely, it, it really is. We're already seeing it and um, yeah, it's going it, to it's going to keep growing. You, you're effectively seeing that um, older people are getting more comfortable with the concept of renting. I mean, it used to be psychologically that you, you talk to older people about renting and they'd say, oh no, renting's for poor people. You know, I've always owned a home. Poor people rent. I'm not poor, and 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 I think gradually that's changing. And what you probably touched on with some of these other webinars with the kind of hospitality model, like people are understanding that you know, hospitality can be built into your living environment now, and that's something which is particularly attractive for older people. And it's it's generally the kind of barrier to entry is lower. Um, barriers, not that's not the right term. The kind of friction points are lower. There are fewer friction points for someone looking to move in to rent a product than buy a product. So it allows a customer to kind of say, an older customer to say, hey, I wanna try this out maybe. Um, it's, it, it, it's, an, it's like a, it's a smoother transition and it's an easier sell effectively. It's less a do or die kind of product. Um, so yeah, you know, we're seeing a lot of more retirement rental schemes coming up and I think it's only gonna grow. Yeah. So, so things are starting to change, but it strikes me there is still a big marketing challenge to convince um, these people who are rattling around in homes, which are far too big for them to, to, to take the plunge. Um, how is the industry as a whole addressing that? Or is it, is it left down to sort of individual operators to do that? Justin, do you want to start with that? Sure. So you're saying, so you're basically saying uh, as the sector as a whole trying to change, is that what you're saying? Well, who, who is doing a good job of, of reaching these people who, who have a lot of equity tied up in houses that are unsuitable for them? Who, how do you reach them and how do you persuade them to move into something more suitable? Um, that is the million dollar question that everyone's trying to, everyone's trying to, uh, everyone's trying to solve, right? It's the holy grail, if you can get that. Um, I think, yes, there, there hasn't been traditionally the, the right kind of products on offer, and we certainly hope that our product will be much more competitive than other things that people look at. Um, so yeah, we definitely hope that by nature of creating more product and better quality product in different kind of locations, different kind of, you know, different price points, different brands. There are a lot of other kind of new people entering the space that how do that begin to get people out of their home, say. Um, and I think it's just over time, it's going to be an educational piece as well, right? It's like, it's educating people about the benefits of, of you know, moving into a community where you're around people, you don't run the risk of loneliness and isolation as much. Um, but it's a really tough sell, right? And I think ultimately, most older people will always just stay in their home. And that's just like it's a more acute problem here in the uk where where home ownership is is such a such a big thing yeah i mean it it is like it's a it's a, it's it's a problem because we would like to take 100 percent of the market but it's also not a problem because if we can take one percent of the market that's like we'd be the biggest player ultimately right like it's so um the market is so huge 
and that there is it's kind of fine that most people will always end up staying in their family sized home because there are just so many people and um the, the they that population growth is just growing 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 so uh yeah i did see it like it'll it'll change but it's not gonna i don't think it's gonna be like hey we'll see like everyone living in retirement communities it's, we don't need that you just need choice ultimately there's been um yeah, there's, been, there's been quite a ch sorry yeah do you want to pick up on that one i want to talk about investment <laughs> but please go for it two, two quick things one uh i think it's it's the same discussion when when sort of student housing uh, came up everybody started investing in student housing yeah we, we need we need student housing we i don't know we blow it off the shirt uh the student hotel did an amazing job they're, they're tremendously great players in the market did all students move into a student housing complex obviously not that's not necessary we don't need neither justin or me could even cope with the demand that is out there uh focusing on, on that transition so it, it, i don't think it's it's uh it, it's a demand uh, driven uh kind of, kind of logic that appeals i think it's really about diversification it's about a changing habitus and it's about social demographic change it's not so much about age change it's not so much about demographic change for me it's really about demo, uh, social demographic change so the baby boomer generation just grew up tremendously different they sort of brought wealth to the hospitality industry. They brought wealth to the travel industry. Now they demand something different. And, and when they don't get it, they start producing it themselves, right? So I think on the demand side, it's just very different. Also on the marketing challenge you mentioned, I think it's, it's a diametrical, uh, t different, different model. Traditional care homes would always mark towards children and peers. So it will either be the, the doctor that recommends the place, it will be the, the children that go check those places out and then say, try to convince mom or dad to move there, but it's never the people that actually end up there. I think what we see in that social demographic change, what I mean is that the customer of tomorrow or actually of today, they don't buy into shit that other people, uh, especially not their kids or their doctors tell them, they want to decide for themselves. So it's about, again, around the mental framework, I want to own that decision. So I think when you talk about the marketing challenge, I think it's very much about changing the narrative and focus on who's really your customer and not to sort of this, let's say the the peers of, the, of those customers uh, just as a quick intro but let's totally run into uh, investment topics yeah. yeah okay so let's talk about it, uh, the attitudes of the investment community to this sector is it is it something more attractive to them now than it has been you know you know in in, in past years and, and how are you finding it when you're trying to talk to people to, to raise money what sort of reception are you getting i think interestingly uh throughout 2019 uh and let's say the first couple of months of 2020 the discussion were very different to the ones that started to embark after march mm -hmm. i think prior we would always be sort of yeah that's totally necessary but not really sure how and people were maybe a little bit more hesitant and sort of the, the biggest receptive the receptions we received were from traditional senior living operators trying to use our product as sort of their let's say upscale product for their for their for their group which is not what we what we're looking for and that's not what we are after so our customer again is afraid of senior living so for us affiliating ourselves with a big senior living operator might be harmful in that regard so for us the focus has been different I think after March, the, the, the market changed and also the perception changed. As I said earlier, I think asset managers, investors really need to think through their, their portfolios at the moment, uh, restructuring their, uh, their exposure to risks. Uh, I think the residential component and, and sort of specifically transforming uh, prior office use, prior retail use, prior hospitality use to residential zoning will be a discussion in city halls. We see a lot more coming up. For the, for the basic principle of uh, investors are not looking <laughs> on, um, yeah, on, on, on taking a smaller yield or a smaller rent uh, in due course. So they need uh, occupiers of those assets that are still able to pay their premium rent. They sort of managed to, to grow over the last couple of uh, years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that there is a challenge for those asset managers. But I think when it comes back to who are the people that, that are keen to joining our investments at the moment, we see a lot of uh, traditional uh, and, 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 and let's say old and stable capital uh, really rethinking their entire structure and portfolio. 
Justin, does that tally with your experience? Yeah, definitely. So I think, yeah, a lot of what you said around, around, oh, you know, what's happened to capital over the last six months is really true. And it's kind of, yeah, there's still a lot of money around and people need something to put it in. And I mean, no one wants to put it in. Well, I mean, you've got to be super selective on retail. People are beginning, I mean, I, I would think you've got to be pretty selective on office allocation, uh, hospitality, sorry to say this, <laughs> you know, struggling also like, you know, people like, but the money's still there. It needs to go somewhere. Um, and so definitely this is a, it's a kind of obvious place. It's an obvious place to put it. Um, so definitely that's, yeah, I agree that that's something we've seen. I think, we, you know, one of your other questions at the beginning was, you know, how have, have we found it generally? Um, so, you, you know, I set this company up two and a half years ago and it was really hard ultimately <laughs> at the beginning. Like, it's like, it, it was, it was it, it, for the first year and a half, we found it really, really difficult to raise capital. People were just like, and it, it, I, I get it, right? We were asking for huge amounts of capital to um, build something which is, which it hasn't been done and is like untried and untested. And that's like a huge, it's a huge risk, right? And so um, it's, it's a really hard thing to do to deliver a new product in the retirement, well, in any space in real estate, because it's, it's not, it, it's a risk averse sector and it's you're living huge sums of capital so the, the the way that we kind of worked it out worked through it and you know we're fortunate enough to be working with some really really great financing partners now um who we're really happy with and have completely bought into the vision but it's all about ultimately taking them on the journey <coughs> it's all about you know, complete open transparency from day one not trying to pretend that we're not something we're not I'm not trying to pretend that we've got all the answers when we didn't you know taking them to see come to our customer workshops to meet people hear like what customers are saying see the competition and really kind of bring them on that journey around you know this is this is how we are approaching the sector and we are going to make our product better than everyone else's and it's going to be more competitive and through that learning you just you're just gradually building trust we're now at a place where we've got some, you know, a number of funders that we've been working with for over, you know, over a year and they're just really comfortable with what we're doing. And, um, and that for us has just been the way to do it, which is a frustrating because, you know, when I look back at the kind of business plan I created two and a half years ago, I would have said, hey, you know, we're operational by this point and get the first site within six months and stuff. And unfortunately, that just, that's just not the way it is. But it's, uh, I guess we've learned that it's a really long-term game and that building trust with investors is the most important thing. And that's what's kind of got us to the place so far. Um, so if there's anyone else out there who's looking at kind of um, setting up something new in the space or whatever, like I'd say absolutely go for it. It's really exciting. And there's huge, huge opportunity. Um, but be prepared. It's going to take a long time. It's going to be painful. Thanks, Justin. Um, this hour has flown by. We've actually just gone gone past three o'clock so I need to um, just run through a, a quick uh, few slides before thanking you guys for what's been a really interesting discussion. Uh, a couple of other webinar threads that we've got going on, um, one for the short-term rentals uh, sector called Rockstars which is hosted by my colleague Paul. Uh, the next one of those is on October the 27th and the Boutique Hotel Trailblazer series hosted by Eloise. Um, there are a few of those here. The next one is October the 19th. So as I mentioned earlier, um, this session is one of a series which is a pre precursor to the Urban Living Festival, which is now taking place in London uh, on the 7th and 8th of July next year. And we've already got a fantastic uh, list of sponsors and media partners for that event that you can see there. We're really looking forward to this event. It's going to be great to get back together on a large scale. Um, if you are interested in being a sponsor or a speaker, please contact my colleague Katie, whose details are there and also in the chat um, on the right of your screen, along with all the links. Uh, thank you to Comscope for sponsoring today. Our next two sessions are on hotel hybrids and hostels on October the 28th. Uh, and new real estate models and prop tech investors on November the 4th. So thanks for joining us today, everybody. Thanks ever so much to you, Justin, and to you, Jan, for your insights into your exciting new approaches to this market. And uh, hope to see all of you on the next website. See you soon. Thanks very much. Take care. Thanks. Stay safe. Yeah.